So now we are moving on with a presentation uh, by uh, Marco Silari. So I will just say a few words on, uh, on his career. So Marco obtained a PhD in medical physics in 85. And then he moved to CERN in uh, 96. But before that, he worked with um, the Italian National Research Council and with Professor Ugo Amaldi on the Italian Hydrogen Therapy Project. So at CERN, he's worked on radiation protection around the SPS, PS, lab accelerators. He was responsible for radiation protection of lab decommissioning. And he's been involved with radiation protection studies of the LHC experiments and for future CERN accelerators. In addition to all this uh, scientific and uh, technical aspect, he's got a long experience on, um, on Marie Curie projects. And, uh, and still has, because you are still very active in this domain. So he's um, uh, been the scientist in charge of the EU Marie Curie project RADENV on accelerator radiation protection and ARDENT on advanced radiation dosimetry. So now I leave the work to Marco. You've got the microphone. I got the microphone. Thank you, Cecile, for this nice introduction. And uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to CERN, for those who came to CERN for this event. Um, so um, I'm going to give uh, a, a half an hour overview of the involvement of CERN in the Marie Curie uh, action, and we call it an international success story because, as you know, CERN is an international laboratory. We are European laboratory, most European, but in fact, all the research which is done here is done um, with the research that coming throughout the world. So I mean, what we do is actually for the benefit of the entire um, world, in fact. So let me start first with uh, thanking some of the colleagues who have provided some of the material I'm going to show you today. I couldn't show it all because I had too much. I will, will give you some of my own experience, but I also tried to give some experience from some example from a few of the Marie Curie program we've been running at CERN since, since many years. Um, so I don't pretend that these flags uh, cover the entire uh, nationality that represented at CERN, but just to tell you, that in fact, I mean, Marie Curie fellow come from, from all over the world. There's no nationality limitation in terms of applying for a Marie Curie Fellow. They can be from all over the world. We will, you will have a few examples in the next uh, couple of minutes. The only rule is the mobility rule, which is one of the basic rules of the European Union. So you cannot uh, apply for a Marie Curie Fellowship in the country, and in this respect, CERN counts as a country, if you have been working there or studied there for more than 12 months over the past 56. So if somebody wants to apply for a Marie Curie Fellowship at CERN, you should not, or you should not have been at CERN for more than 12 months over the past three years. Apart from that, there's no, there's no, there's no limitation. And let's go back to the early uh, phase. I mean, uh, I, w uh, I only got involved in 2005, in fact, but uh, CERN was actually involved in Marie Curie Fellowship already back with FP5, starting in 98. Um, this was really the launch pad for CERN involvement in, uh, in this fellowship program um, as a host laboratory. Uh, and we had at that time 20 uh, fellows for periods of two years. And now um, I would like to start, in fact, the presentation by quoting two of my former uh, Marie Curie fellows. You know, Stefan and Degidio were part of RADEM, which was, I will say a few words afterward, was uh, at the time in FP, in FP6, uh, one of the uh, early projects. Um, and they, I'm still in contact with them. I mean, I'd, we had the three Marie Curie fellows in, in, the, in the, the program. And uh, I asked them to send me a photo and uh, a few, and just a line of what they were thinking of the program, which I think was very nice. You know, Stefania, after the Marie Curie Fellowship that she ended in 2010, she went to PSI to work on medical physics for party for the Medostone project. She went to the um, School of Medicine in California, and now she moved back to Europe. She's in, uh, which is starting now with the Airy Beam Line in Prague. And the GDO, after the hand of his Marie Curie Fellow, went straight to Nucleco which is a company in Rome dealing with uh, essentially a manager radioactive waste and is still there after many years. So that brings me to some statistics that I got uh, from, from Cecile, which I slightly simplified, not to charge you too much with, 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 with numbers. Uh, that, I mean, there's a statistic for the FP6 uh, participation of CERN. In fact, I mean, the participation of CERN in, in FP6. Actually, this program was between 2002 and 2006, and of course, I mean, you know, the, the last um, project ended up in 2010. Uh, at that time, we had uh, early stage training. So the three people I mentioned was, you know, the Stefania, Gideon, Sophie, who is still actually at CERN, Sophie Mallow. I mean, I, I didn't got a, a photo from her, so I couldn't show it. Um, they were early stage training. 
Um, and these were essentially pre-doc, so they came to CERN also to do a doctorate. Um, but we also had uh, the possibility to, to hire postdoc, so people with more experience. Um, the EST was actually a monocyte project, which then was taking over an FP7, and which has disappeared in Horizon 2020. And we also had a program which was called RTN, which was a research training network, which is the, the precursor of the what it became, the multi-site in FP7. And we had a total of 98 researchers that served in this program um, for a total FT or 170 uh, you know, men or women here, if you want, and the 12 million funding, which was quite substantial. Um, so Serna, we had the 16 projects which we were coordinating and two were participating as a, as a beneficiary. Uh, I was just mentioning RADEM. I mean, I talk about this because actually I was a scientist in charge, so I know a bit more than, than the others. So RADEM was the radiation protection studies and environmental study for future accelerators. So one of the projects, I mean, there was somebody working on click, there was somebody working on beta beams, there was somebody working on Lena 4. So um, we worked for three years. I mean, this Marie Curie fellow worked in close contact with the civil engineering work and the uh, architect designer at CERN. Um, and starting from the design of the machine and the design of the building, we converted that into a nice fluke geometry and the color process on the right is the, is the neutron streaming from the machine tunnel into the waveguide ducts or the ventilation duct to calculate the dose um, that you could get into accessible areas. And this was in 2005, to 2000, sorry, six to nine, and it was part of the uh, radiation protection for future accelerator. If you can to send today, the future accelerator has become reality. So if you go now close to Aston 2, you have the Lina 4, and it's nice to see that, I mean, what we designed with this Marie Curie fellow is actually became a reality. So, I mean, actually, the Marie Curie program is not only, you know, to try research, but they were really working on real project of, in, of, of importance for the lab. Um, so after FP6 came FP7, and the involvement of CERN uh, grew up, um, we had, uh, a total of you know more than 55 million funding from from this program. Um, a, a lot of share was from the ITN, the initial training network that was pursued in Horizon. We see in a moment. We had uh, 270 FT working on, on various projects, 11 as a coordinating it and eight as a beneficiary. Uh, but there was also the start of COFAN, which is a very important program which CERN uses, and we had a lot of success because over the years CERN got in FP7 28 million to co-fund our fellowship program, so the normal fellowship program. So we managed to actually recruit uh, 185 researchers, giving them a third year contract out of our normal fellowship program. So in total, the, um, the program was quite successful. I mean, it was also uh, a number of individual fellowship granted. Um, Mostly in theory, in fact, I mean, the experience over the year showed that, I mean, uh, theory gets a good share of the individual fellows. Um, but in total, I mean, uh, FP7 got nearly 500 FTE working at CERN over the entire program. That thing was, 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 was very good. Um, when we actually had two out of the only four monocyte project funding un under this program. Now, let me give you a few examples. So I'm, I'm happy that Ethernet is here because I'm starting with one of the projects. So I got some, some examples from, from some of you know, the key um, projects that were, were was a coordinator. I'm not going to go into scientific details, technical details, because I mean, the world is there until uh, next week. Um, so PicoSec was between 2011 and 2015, and was a program to develop a new class of ultra fast photon detectors for PET, so for medical application, and energy physics. And of course, I mean, a project of this size is, is a big project because, I mean, first, the PicoSet recruited uh, 22 researchers. Uh, in FP7, you could recruit other postdoc, which were called experienced researchers, or, or uh, uh, younger people at the doctoral level who were called early stage researchers. And most of them, actually, of the early stage, uh, took the opportunity of PicoSet to, to do a doctorate. Um, they came from uh, many different nationalities, so I mean, the recruiting is really worldwide. Uh, they work in 11 partners spread over six European countries. So you see a nice geographical distribution uh, and also a good gender balance uh, for, 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 for PicoSec. I mean, a Marie Curie project, I mean, an ITN is a, is a real scientific project. I mean, the scientific part and the training part are equally important. 
So you have to structure it as a real project. So a real project typically is organized in work packages. So I mean, this is just an example. I'm not gonna show too many details, but I mean, for instance, um, PicoSec had uh, five work packages dealing with the different scientific uh, topics. And the researchers, they have a supervisor that are attributed typically to one or more work package. And they really work in a network to achieve a scientific result. And doing this, they do on-the-job training, and they also get all the opportunity to get more formal training like conference and things like that. But the European Union puts a lot of accent on uh, getting out of the lab or, or the network the results. So there are two important aspects. One is dissemination, which is to say publication in the scientific domain, but especially in conference, giving presentation, but also outreach. Outreach is to try to teach, to, to, to explain the general public what you're doing with essentially public funding. So this is an example of, a, of an outreach event that PicoSec ran in conjunction with Pacman, which I will mention later on, which is another uh, sun coordinated network. So you also um, try to link in between different projects, not just uh, not just uh, working within your own network. Outreach is also going out, for instance, to local schools or local community, like the one in Maran, which is just around the corner, uh, to explain to, to, to school boys and school girls you know, what science is doing. And they also, you can also produce a brochure to, uh, to more for the, for the, to target the, 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 the scientific audience. And this is something to essentially to make uh, Europe and the, and the entire world um, knowledgeable about what you do, in fact. Um, another uh, program that was rather successful, I must say, because it was something in charge, so it, it was successful, <laughs> it was Arden, which was a purely uh, detector R&D for uh, dosimetric applications. So um, it was between 2012 and 2016. We had uh, a consortium of various university and, and, um, and industrial partners, and specifically, we also had a non-European partner as partner organization, not a beneficiary, not recruiting, but we had the University of Houston, Ontario, and Wollongong to provide training and participate in, in our research activities. Um, we had 18 researchers, and I think one of them is still in this own because it's now on another, on another project. And from 11 different uh, nationalities, in fact, was, we also have so people from, from Australia, for instance, from, from Colombia, from, from India, from Mauritius. So it was recruitment was, was really worldwide. Um, I mean, I give you just one single result. I mean, that CERN, CERN is known because we develop various types of detectors. One is the GEM, which is a gas electron multiplier, which is used for energy physics. The other one is the TEMPIX, which is a silicon sensor coupled to a to, a, to an ASIC uh, with a pixelated uh, um, uh, readout of 55 micron. And we managed during Arden to put the two together. So we developed what we call the GEMPIX, which is now used in many different applications, which is actually coupling a three triple gem gas detector to the MediPix readout. And it's used now in dark matter research. We use it CERN for medical application, for measuring weakly radioactive uh, um, low energy photon emitters in, in metallic waste, and so on and so forth. So there are you know, real results out of a project which also, as I said, involved uh, dissemination and outreach. So for instance, one of the workshops we ran, we had the annual workshop, was, was in Milan. In uh, 2013, it was the 160, 150th anniversary of the Polytechnic of Milan. So they had a huge number of celebrations throughout the years. And one of those was our workshop, which where we invited something like 200 uh, uh, schoolboys from local high schools, in fact. Um, to come to the Polytechnical. So the Arden researcher was actually um, showing the technology developed during the project. And I think it was quite a successful uh, event. Another interesting project I'd like to mention is Pacman that I mentioned before. Um, this was actually an, a, a, a doctorate program. It was um, a, within the ITM, it was a doctorate one. And they recruited 10 uh, researchers. It was, a, again, as you see, a huge, I mean, large, consortium, and all the researchers were at CERN, in fact. And they, Pacman had an excellent gender bar, 50-50, which is not easy because sometimes you don't get enough female applicants for the, for the selection process. And they get 50-50 with gender bars. Um, again, this is just the structure in uh, work packages. I mean, they the similar structure. And that was essentially to design uh, metrology and alignment tools for uh, particular set of components. And um, they also ran lots of uh, uh, 
outreach activities. I mean, the top left, you see our former, the former prime minister of Italy visiting and meeting the researchers. Uh, in the middle there, there was a meeting with the Bulgarian Minister of Education. Um, and you also see on the right, again, um, activity with, uh, you know, smaller kids. Uh, in terms of scientific outcome, just mentioned one that I got from LN. In fact, I mean, this is a complex setup for measuring uh, positioning of, for instance, click uh, accelerator equipment. And you see from the, from, from the slide, you know, there was a, a, a measuring machine with the uncertainty of 0.3 micron of a meter. So, you know, 3 times the amount of 7. So very, very precise. So again, this is scientific outcome, real technology outcome, out of a project which is designed for training. Another one which is successful is CAFI, uh, where you see in the photo the Yassin Kadi was the, was the scientist in charge, and Seamus also there, appearing during one of the events uh, held, uh, I think, at CERN. Um, and these were actually dealing with uh, um, uh, act research activities at the Isolde facility, and in particular for the upgrade to the, to the Isolde. And they also, of course, did, did uh, outreach. And one event, where I think all of the researchers, all the Marie Curie fellow who were at CERN at that time participated in the open days. I mean, we had the last open day in 2013. Uh, this is a huge event where, in fact, over two days, we had something like probably 50 visit points organized and men, where essentially everybody in the lab was volunteering to, to, to help. And of course, it was a good opportunity for the uh, Marie Curie Fellow to participate. Um, finally, in 2014, we start in Horizon 2020. Um, so far, we're about midway for the program, although I mean, the last project will be funded in 2020 to continue up until 2023, 2024. Uh, so far, CERN got one uh, project uh, funded as a coordinator per call, so four so far, another five as a beneficiary. Um, at the moment, we have 51 FTE at CERN, 19 researchers for typically three years, most of them. And at the moment, the, uh, the funding for the ITM program is nearly 15 million. Again, the co-fund, we had a successful co-fund proposal. At the moment, we are co-funding 60 uh, researchers for, or we will co-fund 60 researchers, 60 fellow, CERN fellow, under the normal program for the next few years for the third year, for more than 6 million funding. And, um, we also have some participation in the RISE, which is industrial academic. And the total you see there, at the moment we have uh, 20 grant agreements which we are uh, participating, so it's a pretty huge amount of work for Cecil and the HR colleagues. Uh, and with 85 people at CERN at the moment. And I have just one example from Horizon, which is Easy Train, which is uh, a program which uh, just start, it started this year on um, um, superconducting technologies with a huge consortium of partners from both academic and industry. Um, say they just started, we continue until 2021. The budget is, I mean, 15 uh, researchers, approximately 4 million. And again, the scientific topic rotate about the application or development of superconductivity for a broad range of applications. But of course, they also have industry heavily involved. Um, and an interesting thing, I mean, they just started, but they already did quite some interesting uh, activities, you know. Um, now, uh, the hackathon is a, is a typical activity which is gaining um, traction, and it's very interesting because what you do, you set up a one, two, three day event. Uh, here at San we do it in Idea Square, which is just uh, across the road where uh, Atlas is, 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 is located. And you have teams of students with the support of some um, senior professional. And they get together, well, they do some preparation before, they come together, they spend one or two days together, and they try to come up with ideas and, if possible, prototype products um, for that can, can then be explored later on. And so, you say, the, although, you know, um, they just started, I mean, Easy Train just started, they ran an hackathon a few weeks ago in, in Idea Square, and I think it was, it was a very successful program. So to conclude, I would like to just a few, few slides in which some reflection of, of, of the, of, on, on the Marie Curie program itself. So it's very successful soon, FP7, so practically since the end of the 90s. Um, and it's very, there's a very good complementarity between CERN mission, which is essentially energy physics, and the EU um, wishes, if you like. And in fact, to training young scientists, and it's all about to come to give them a good opportunity to develop their career. 
And if you go back to the two examples I gave in the very beginning of the two people, what we mean, you know, more than 10 years ago, I mean, that was quite successful, I mean, because they, they found a job uh, somewhere else. So, um, and I say, I mentioned again CONFAN because I think it's an important program that, that, that uh, CERN is running in this respect. Uh, so, it is clear that CERN is an international laboratory, so people come in here, in fact, they gain, um, you know, they're exposed to the international environment, and then the idea is that they go back to their own country or to some other country, you know, taking back what they've learned here, and then um, feeding it into the academia or, or, or industrial sector in, 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 other, in other parts of Europe. So the value of CERN as a technological and innovation training center is clearly recognized. And I must say there is an excellent relationship between you know, the people more actively involved with the Marie Curie program and other EU program uh, with, the, with the research executive agency and the, and the DG uh, in, in Brussels. Um, from FP6, we give to our Marie Curie Fellow a fellowship contract because um, this is online, in fact, with the recommendation of the Charter of Code to, to improve the, uh, um, the, 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 the working condition of researchers. So um, Marie Curie Fellow do not get a, a, a doctorate style contract here, but they get a fellowship style. So, it's, so they get a, 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 a contribution to a pension fund, and uh, so they are recruited as junior fellows. Um, of course, th there is a strong benefit from this mobility. I mean, the fact that you cannot do your Marie Curie Fellow in the country where you study pushes you out and try to explore something else. And then you can always go back to your country after you've done three years experience somewhere else. Um, and from what we hear, the Marie Curie action are actually employed, uh, you know, with employers, I mean, they, they are appreciated by the employers because, I mean, they, they see the benefit of this, you know, broaden of, of, the, of, the, of the vision of the people working on these international programs before going actually into the real, if you like, um, uh, in, industrial work. And in fact, I mean, if you've seen again from the two examples I gave you before, in the very beginning, there is a lasting effect in securing the post, not just, you know, immediately afterwards. But if you look at Felipe Stefania, I mean, she went to PSI, she went to, to California, as back in Europe in, in Prague. So, I mean, there's a, I mean, what she learned, I think, also, uh, no, help her in, 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 in getting, you know, continued in, the, in their career. And I would also like to mention that uh, since FP7, in fact, now we use the, the, the structure which is in place for the normal recruitment at CERN for the recruitment of Marie Curie Fellow. So typically, if CERN is coordinating the program, we use the e-recruitment tool to centralize the applications. Um, our HR department makes the first uh, screening of the eligibility of the applicants, and then, of course, the CVs are distributed throughout the network for the selection. But we follow the same selection process as for staff. So, I mean, a, a, a formal interviews with the board, where there is a representation from the various sectors, including HR, and, and then you know a feedback to the to the to the people who have been invited for interviewing. There are, of course, some challenges. It's not everything always you know plus competition is becoming extreme. At the moment, the um, success rate since many years of the ITN, which is not say, the major problem, is below 10%, which is very tough because I'm now writing a new proposal. I can tell you the amount of work that goes into it. And of course, when I write a proposal, we all think that the proposal we've written is the best of all, which is not necessarily the case. So the fact that success rate is low is because maybe somebody has, has written something better. So it may happen. Eh? Uh, at some level, a specific problem, which is the Swiss euro exchange rate, because the contribution of the European Union are in euros, and CERN is <laughs> Swiss franc. So we were running Swiss franc. So with the lower exchange rate, I feel the, the contribution from the EU is less than the fellowship uh, value, so we have to put a little bit of money. But I'm used to say that, I mean, you know, even EU programs are not really for free. I mean, I'm saying the EU contribution is a resource amplifier because you still have to put in supervisory work. I mean, I know, I mean, when, when I was sent as a chance of Ardent for the, those four years, 30% of my time went, went into that to run, to run the network. I mean, it is a huge amount of work. Eh? But you get resources to do a lot of work. So um, this is part of the game, if you like. Now, um, with Horizon 2020, the involvement of industry is more and more important which may be not such an issue if you have a technology program, 
but if you are working in the theory department, maybe it's less easy to get <laughs> industry heavily involved. Of course, I mean, this goes, I mean, with uh, everything now in the, in the world, IP and ethical assets are becoming more and more uh, critical. And as I mentioned before, uh, it, it, we have a relatively low, say, contribution of the individual fellowship program to the overall uh, CERN program. And traditionally, most of the individual fellow apply for work for, you know, for research projects in either the theory or the um, physics department. So we shouldn't be trying to find the way to encourage them to apply for other, for other applications. So to summarize what the Marie Curie fellow gets, you know, excellent research project to start with, because for me, the, the training and the research are equally important, so they really get excellent research projects. And you, it must be excellent, otherwise you don't get funding. Eh? So that's, that, that's uh, clear. They got lots of training, because I mean, the lab gets a substantial amount of money to be spent on their training, that is conferences, uh, formal schools, um, to buy instrumentation which are needed for the, for the daily job. Um, but they also get complementary skills. I mean, as a byproduct, essentially, for everybody coming and doing a doctorate, sir, they learn French. Because they stay here for three years, this is a French-speaking region, and more or less everybody speaks French at the end of the three years. But they, also, they are also exposed, they can also participate in many courses in management, um, communication, uh, project management, entrepreneurship. I mean, in Arden, we run a one-week uh, business administration courses for them where they also you know, learn a little bit of the basic if you want to set up your own company when you finish the, the, the Marie Curie. They get good employment financial condition. It should not be hidden, I mean, because, I mean, I think an equivalent uh, fellow working at Italian university will certainly not get the amount of, uh, you know, salary that we get here. And as I said before, it's all about career development. And if you want to learn more about CERN, you go to the um, um, CERN EU project office website, and there's a, there's a link on the Marie Curie action at CERN, where you get uh, updated information on uh, what we do with the Marie Curie steering group. You get information on, well, information on the current program where you can apply, uh, information on how to write a proposal, hopefully it's successful. And of course, if you have any questions, you can contact me or Cecil or the Sweat in the EU project office. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation and overview. Um, I was wondering, as you have now a lot of experience with uh, putting uh, together um, such programs, what is your, or at least an insight to the criteria to the selection of the, of the beneficiaries? Does this happen in a more or less uh, natural way, or do you need to think beforehand uh, which type of partners could be involved? How, how does this process uh, work? Well, I think, I mean, so I've, I, can, I can talk about, you know, my direct experience and a little bit of the experience I gained by talking to people and maybe revise a few other proposals. I think it's important you start with a clear idea. You know, to write, I mean, talking about the ITN, right? of course, I mean, the co-fund is something else because, I mean, it's clearly focused on the fellowship program. The individual fellowship, you write your own application together with the host lab. But the ITN or the, the, the European doctor, which is a seminar structure, the challenge is that you have to have sort of 10, 15 individual projects which should match. And that's complicated. Because sometimes you start, you know, assemble the thing and then try to, so, I mean, the, I think you should start with having a clear idea of the overall picture you want to have, and then try to select the partners. Of course, you will have already some preferential links with a number of partners. Try to select the partners looking for projects that would fit well into the global picture. That's what I would do now, what I'm actually doing now, is not necessarily maybe the right way to get funded, but is, is what I would think would be important. And then, of course, you need industries. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.